Good afternoon, Glory Church. It's good to have everyone just joining for the service. Just want to welcome you guys for the Sunday service. Hope you guys all had a great week. And also want to say happy Father's Day. I didn't forget that, right? Yeah, happy Father's Day to all our um, fathers of Glory LA. We love you guys. We appreciate you guys. Just want to appreciate you guys, yeah. Um, yeah, before we begin, let's spend some time uh, just preparing our hearts for the service. This week, I was really reflecting, and God was really uh, revealing how I was so selfish. I was so, um, just so into my own things, my own agenda, and I forgot to really rejoice in the gospel. I forgot to really be thankful for the smallest thing to big things. Just really thanking God, and I think it's so important for us to have a heart of just thankfulness to our Father who is faithful, who is always consistent and just faithful, loving, and yeah, I forgot how kind our God is because I'm so focused on myself or ourselves. And I want to just open up this time for us to come before our Lord, just really humbly our hearts, just lay down everything that we have and just come before our Father, our Heavenly Father, who desires and just want to listen to us and be there for us. So why don't we do that at this time? Let's, let us come before our Father and give thanksgiving and really prepare our heart for the service. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and your kindness, your mercy and your grace and your love. Father, we repent just for our hearts, God, even in our actions, how we made everything about us, not about you, Lord. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for just loving us, God. And how you really desire to be with us. For your people to really just know you simply, God. Yeah, Father, I want to just lift up this time to you, Lord, that let this service or this worship be all about you, Lord. That will exalt you, Father. That will praise your name, Father. As you proclaim the power of your gospel, Lord, and your spirit that's in us, God. Yeah, we'll proclaim your goodness, Father, to people around us, wherever we're at, we are at Father. Continue to just work in us, God. Give up, Father. That we'll continue to walk the walk with you, Lord Father. So once again, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We give this all to you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us recite the Apostles' Creed. Just follow along with me. Let us begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he would come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of a body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, I want to open this time to just greet one another, saying happy Sunday, saying hello, hello, and it will begin.
for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb and every knee will bow before him you I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing of you, and you are only so great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy. I'm so See
the churches, Father, in LA, nation, over the world, or Father, that you will bring us together, God, that we will be all by your gospel, Lord, that there is power in your gospel, Lord, Father, that we need your boldness, God, we need your courage, Lord, help us to fight our flesh, God. equipping us, that's building us. Now truly, Father, experience that, God. Meet us here, Lord.
church that's we declare that together sing it together how we build so I will build Glory, I want to take this time and lead us into a time of prayer before the message. And I think this song just brings me to a remembrance of my calling, my purpose, our calling, our purpose as His church. That we would build the foundation of our salvation on nothing else apart from the love which God our Father poured out through His Son Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit now has been manifest to the whole world. And I just couldn't sit and just, my heart's breaking. My heart's breaking for the things of God's heart. As an American, we are in an uproar of a pain, of a process of lamenting, of reconciliation. There is racial reconciliation that's taking place in America. And yesterday for Juneteenth, we were able to, part of our church, we were able to participate in a prayer walk in K-Town. 
and we took the time just walking around, just praying over the city for justice, for ra racial reconciliation, for our black brothers and sisters who have been oppressed through centuries in this land. And I realize just even this, 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 in this moment as we're singing the scripture as Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, if one part of your body hurts, shouldn't the whole body hurt? And I realize like it doesn't matter of the political agendas, it doesn't matter about all this, what side is more, there are people suffering. Yes, there are people suffering in the world. We are aware of the hunger. We're aware of the injustices that's happening in Asia, in Muslim communities. We are aware of that. But in our current land, which you and I reside in America, there is racial reconciliation that God is dealing with. And if you're not out there in the mission, we're part of this mission of sharing God's light, being God's love. And as I was walking the streets yesterday, there was people all over. They don't know who we are. They just see a bunch of Asian people just walking in the streets. They're honking. They're saying, thank you. And it just really put me in perspective. I'm a hist I love history. You know, German has their history of really trying to eradicate the Jewish people. Japanese has their history of trying to eradicate, take over all of Asia, Chinese, Korean, we're all included. We're victims of that. But do you know one thing about those two countries I'm just picking out too, and that is there was huge reform. When the Germans lost World War II, there was huge reform in their laws, in their clause, in their policies that would never, ever allow such things to happen in that nation again. In Japan, do you know that there is no one active military? Yes, there is a national defense, but there is no active military. Why? Because it was a reform for them owning up to what they have done against other nations, against other groups of people. America has never reformed. Yes, we made amendments, 13th amendments. There's clauses in that amendment which, which we still take away laws against criminals. Not just talking about black people, but criminals. They can't vote. They will be forced into labor with no income, no, no fees. Which private companies take ownership of that? These are just few. And I'm lamenting with God's heart because God cares about people. It's not policies. It's not politics. Yes, policies, pol those matter. I'm going to vote. You should vote. But God's heart breaks for people, for you, for me. And he's so merciful. He's so kind. And if we don't see that, we're just going to see through blurred lenses, just emotions. But God is able to change hearts. And I want to invite you guys into a time of lamenting over our nation. You are in this nation, and I want to invite you guys to lament, complain. Part of crying is complaining to God, where are you? And I'm going to read from Psalm chapter 10, 18 verses. And after I read, I'm going to give a moment of silence. And I'll pray and we'll get on with our message. But even today's message, I think appropriately speaking from Acts 9, there was a man who persecuted the church, who brought so much in acts of injustice. And God changes. He makes history. He reforms. And I pray that there will be reconciliation in our hearts, that there will be a reform in our hearts, that we would no longer look at numbers, but we would see people, we would see faces, and that we would truly be about God's heart in this nation. That we as a church would rise and shine and be the hands, the feet, the voice, the eyes, the ears that God called us to be. There's 
Psalm chapter 10. Why do you stand afar, O Lord? Why do you hide in the times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boast in his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek the Lord. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, all his enemies, he sneers at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be an adversary. His mouth is full of cursing and a deceit and of oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in lurking places of the villages in the secret places. He murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in the waltz wait. He lies in the wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into, the, into his net. And so he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face, he will never see. Arise, O oh Lord, God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account, but you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nation have perished out of his hand or his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Father, let us arise. Let your church arise. There are so much things that's happening in the world and, and it seems as though in my life, I just try to cover it up with my own comfort in my own bubble. As long as I'm okay, my family's okay, Lord. Father, let the church arise. Bring to an awareness, to a remembrance of who we are, what you've called us to be, what you called us for, to act justly, 
to love mercy, to walk humbly and open, able to learn and listen to you. Father, as you called out Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Reach out to our church. Call us by our name. Commission us for the work of your kingdom. Let the church arise. Let us arise to the places and the people that you've called us to. We surrender. We pray for your word, that your word would activate us, that your word would correct us, that your word would empower us, that we would be your ambassadors to the nations starting in America. Bless your church. Reform our hearts and cause us to walk with you. So thank you for everything. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have announcements, guys. Good afternoon, Gloria Lay. The following are announcements for this week. Gloria Lay is set to safely reopen Sunday, July 12th. All members are required to sign up to attend. Those who are living with high-risk family members, such as children and the elderly, are encouraged to stay home and live stream Sunday service. Participate in ushering everlasting change in our city and nation. Join us as we walk and pray for reconciliation next Sunday, June 28th at 10 a.m. Visit our Gloria LA app for more detailed information. Glory Tots will start sending bi-weekly Sunday service videos for children ages 12 to 30 months. If you wish to receive the link, please send a request email to gcem1801 at gmail.com. 2019 Offering Statement for Tax Filing is available. Please send a request email to gcem1801 at gmail.com. Start your morning with your Gloria Lay family as we seek, hear, and pray together Tuesdays and Fridays at 7 a.m. on Zoom. Deepen your understanding of God by learning and growing with your community Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. on Zoom. Allow us to support you in prayer during these challenging times. Submit your prayer requests online through the Glory LA app. Interested in finding more about our family groups? Fill out your information on our Glory LA app. Tithings and offerings can be made through our Glory LA app. Submitting a prayer request is encouraged with your offering. All announcements from previous weeks are posted on our Glory LA app. Type Glory Church LA on the search bar to download from your Google Play or App Store. Welcome Glory LA to Sunday um, afternoon service. Today's message is called, What the Power of the Gospel Can Do. And we're going to continue on from Acts chapter 9, 1 through 22. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. Um, we'll read the scripture together, and then we'll pray and we'll begin. Let's read. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 22. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, approached, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. 
The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard for... Uh, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who call upon his name? And has he not come for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, there is much power in your gospel. There is so much power in your name, Jesus. There is power in your death. There is power in your resurrection. And I ask that you would cause your church to experience this power so that we may once again rely upon you, that we may trust in you, that we may seek you to make change in our lives, that you may awaken the church, Lord, to move according to your power and your power alone. For everything seems impossible but with you all things are possible. So Father, I ask that you would cause your church to experience this power that we always read about, talk about. Lord, that we may live in it now. And that Lord, that the power of your gospel would be experienced with us first, me first, so that we may be about this power in our communities, Lord. So I thank you for your word today. May your word come to life now, Lord, in your congregation. And I ask that you would bless this time. We need you. I need you. Fill me with your word and your authority, Lord, to empower the church today, Lord. I need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we see here Paul and his own conversion. Paul Pryor in chapter 8, we saw him ravaging the churches, imprisoning, going house to house, imprisoning men and women. And we see here he was breathing murderous threats to the disciples of the Lord. And we see him as he is going to Damascus to imprison more Christians and to ruin more Christians' lives. Jesus meets him on this road. And we see Paul instantly believing in Jesus, and being commissioned by Jesus. But before we get into Paul's own conversion and the power of the gospel in his own life, I really want to talk about the prayer walk to kind of lead up into the power of the gospel and what the power of the gospel can do. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the power of the gospel and what a changed heart, a renewed heart through the power of the gospel and the power of the Spirit can do and what we need to do as a church. And so in yesterday's prayer walk, God really emphasized who my brothers and my sisters truly are. And I believe that there will come a time where we will not be separated by race, ethnicity, but we will be separated by who we believe in. 
And I really believe that God is setting up for a grander purpose in our life to unite the church, no matter what race, to truly be united for what's to come in the future. And I love this in Matthew. He says this, and this was being really impressed into my heart yesterday. And he said, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So you see, church, soon when the time comes, when revelation starts being played out, the church will be united by those who do the will of the Father, no matter what background, no matter what skin color, no matter what race. We will be brothers and we will be sisters. And I loved how we were praying for that yesterday, this reconciliation. And I truly believe that for all of the church to be united in the most radical way, we need the power of the gospel to give us that new heart, to play out in our lives, to make this happen. Because soon enough, church, soon enough, if all goes according to plan, if as Christians we believe in the Bible, we will be separated the world would separate us by who we believe in, those who believe in Jesus and the rest of the world. And we need to stand united as a church, no matter who you are. We need to go now and be united and be about the mission that God has sent us on. And I believe these are truly times for the church to stand behind those that are hurting, to make steps, leaps and bounds, to come together, to support and walk with one another as brothers and as sisters. And I love how Pastor Dennis was talking about the body. If one mourns, then we should be mourning. We should be ailing. We should be hurting as well. And I love this. And as we were walking, God put into um, just my mind, um, it, was, it was so random. Um, I was thinking about Evan and as I was thinking about Evan, Pastor Dennis was like, hey, we should, you should reach out to Evan and have him kind of come and have a pan or speak. And I actually called him right after our prayer walk and I reached out and I said, hey, I really need to hear you out and I need some wisdom and guidance for you too. Evan is a men's pastor at the Dream Center and he was so gracious and he was saying, oh man, I, I, I've got a lot to share with you. I've, you know, been processing and thinking about political and societal um, things that are happening un and unfolding right now. And he was like, I'm an open book. You could ask me whatever you want. So this Monday, we're going to grab lunch. And something that God hit me with, and I really want to encourage you today, is this. When we, and I'm going to speak on this personally, when we get all our information just from the media, and I love how Pastor Dennis was kind of talking about this. When all we view is the media and how the media is portraying both sides, both sides have an agenda. And both sides, it really, when I'm looking at and trying to discern and have wisdom on what's happening, because there's an agenda on both sides, compassion completely goes out the door. And when you only look at statistics and these numbers and everyone's refuting by numbers, compassion is completely left out. And God was really encouraging me, go seek out to talk to someone about what they're going through. And I really encourage you, church, before you just voice out your opinion, before you give a statistic, before you give out your viewpoint, I encourage you to seek out someone of that community who is hurting to listen, to simply listen. And this is something I had to really kind of step back and me and Heidi decided, okay, we got to turn the news off. We got to turn this media off and we got to seek out God's voice. And I was so encouraged by, you know, God and even through Dennis that I need to seek out someone from that community to simply listen to their heart, to listen to their story. And so church, I really, um, I'm going to encourage you and I'm going to challenge you today before you say anything else, before you post another story, go and seek out someone from that community to befriend them and to simply listen to what they're going through. 
And from there, have God lead you to support and to walk with. Because I guarantee you, we're going to need to band together soon enough. Christ is coming, and we need to prepare not just the Korean American church, but all churches of all races, of all ethnicities. We need to start becoming one. And I was so encouraged through those prayer walks, and I see God unfolding this, and I envision just all the churches coming together in this way. Jesus is the master over us, and I want to encourage you, church. Jesus is going to get us through this. Amen. So the power of the gospel, and I see Paul, the power of the gospel, and I say this all the time, the greatest miracle to ever happen is to have my own heart become changed. And more than changed, it's actually God giving me a new heart. God gives you a new heart through the power of the gospel. It takes a selfish, I'm talking about my heart, my heart used to be selfish, so selfish, you could ask Heidi, still sometimes selfish. Drug-loving, money-loving, pleasure-seeking, completely disobedient. And he takes the heart and he removes it to give me a new heart that actually now loves God and cares about people. Yes, there's still much growth to be had, but my heart is desiring to love God always. My heart is desiring to love people and care for people. And I want to go deeper into these things. I want to make the effort to really walk side people, to love and to encourage and to build. And I am going to tell you this and be honest. It, it, it has nothing to do with my own effort or my own doing to radically change my heart in this way. It is only through the gospel. It is only through what Christ has done upon that cross, his death, his resurrection, that covers me to give me that newness. And we see this in Paul. Paul in chapter 8 was ravaging the church. He was entering house after house, and he was dragging off men and women, and he committed them to prison. And when you study about this, Paul was always about the poor, especially the poor brothers, the poor sisters, the poor in the church. And one of the commentaries, one of the studies that when you um, kind of when they, when they see how Paul was so much for the poor and they believe Paul was so much for the poor because he was a part of a lot of these families becoming poor because he started ripping these families apart. And to make amends for this, he was always concerned for the poor brothers and sisters that he had, the poor families. And you see this right away in chapter 9. But so still, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This guy wasn't just breathing and saying murderous things. He actually was going and doing it. He was committing them. But this is the Paul that we know today, the Paul that we read in all of Scripture, the Paul that is still making transformation in the lives today, the Paul that is building the church, the Paul that is still, you know, having Christians come alive. His heart was filled with hate and murder against Jesus Christ, persecuting Jesus Christ. And I want to address this today. It is a heart that needs to be completely renewed. Not just changed, but completely new. Because it says this in Matthew. And I love this. It, this you know, Heidi and I have been really, um, we're becoming a, a, an awesome team. And we're really engaging and processing and praying and studying through Scripture together. And she said this, and I love this. She said it really has to do with the heart. And she started reading me Matthew 15. But what comes out of mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart, this is what comes out of the heart, it comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. So when you see hate, especially within racism and racial injustices, these hates come from the heart. And I'm only going to address this as the church because this is something we, myself, and the church need to be renewed in. I share this in my Instagram post. And I was sharing this with Joanna yesterday. I always thought of myself as an American. I never thought of myself as a Korean. The only thing Korean about me is my mouth and my stomach. But what's crazy is I've been raised in a Korean home. 
My mom and my dad have their own bias and prejudices against certain races. It's just, you know, it's sad, but it's true. Most Korean parents do. I know you relate with me. And so in growing up in this environment, I've come to understand it's crazy. I was just, I thought I never had these prejudices or biases. And I'm walking and praying, and God is manifesting my own prejudices. I always joke about it. I make light of it. But it's in there, in the back of my mind. And I had to really do a deep internal heart check of my own. These things come from the heart. That is why God needs to place and replace the heart you have with a brand new heart. It is crucial, so crucial, to have our hearts become new, and this is why. Evil, first of all, evil comes from the heart. We will never prevail against evil in myself and for others if that heart change doesn't happen. The newness of the heart doesn't happen. And it says this, here's another powerful reason why. Hearts are only made new through the gospel and through the power of the gospel and what Jesus Christ has done through the cross. Hearts are only made new through the power of the gospel. And this is what we have to believe and this is what we have to set ourselves in once again, church. We have to rely on this power now. This is the greatest miracle and I know that it's such a hard thing to um, change people. That's why I say it's the greatest miracle, but I am a testament to that. I know you are a testament to that. But it says this in Jeremiah, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. So this is so crucial in receiving this heart, because in receiving this heart, we return to God with our whole heart. In this newness, God places us this newness so that this newness would turn to him wholeheartedly. And guess what happens? Second Chronicles. Guess what happens when we start having this new heart? He says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You guys get this? When we receive this new heart, when God gives us that heart to turn to him wholeheartedly, when we have the heart to turn to him, we will humble ourselves to pray and seek his face. Only when we receive this heart do we humble ourselves to turn to seek his face and to turn from our wicked ways. Guess what happens then? When we do that, then God says, I will hear from heaven. Then will I forgive your sins. Then will I heal your land. And what's crazy about how God heals our land is, especially right now, God has commissioned us. He uses us to heal his land. He uses us to go into the world to bring reconciliation, to restore people, to support people, to walk alongside people, to cause Christ to come, the power of the gospel to unfold in this land. He uses us. The reason why we need to have that new heart through the power of the gospel is because we are the ambassador. I am the messenger. I am the one that God uses to go in this land to bring healing. You, church, are the instrument and are so crucial to the healing and the justice to unfold in this nation. But we cannot do it apart from Christ. You will not do it apart from Christ. Why? Justice originates from God. Justice and righteousness are the foundation of his throne. Without Christ, true justice will never be fulfilled and met. It originates with Jesus. God uses to heal the land, but we need to be prepared. And I love this, and I was sharing this with Hesong in the beginning. A lot of the times when we read the Bible, it becomes discouraging because we see all these characters of the Bible. And when they meet the Lord, they start doing all these amazing things. But the Bible doesn't give you a, a, a timeline. It doesn't give you a year-by-year -year play, a month-by-month -month play. So when you see even the lives of the disciples, and when you see even Paul, I'm going to talk about Paul since we're on Paul. Many people don't know this, but from the point where Jesus met Paul in Damascus on that road, there is a 14-year gap 
from him starting his ministry. But a lot of us read this, we see Paul gets super blessed, has this amazing revelation and experience with Jesus, and all we read is that he starts going, preaching Christ, goes to the disciples, and starts planting churches and doing all these amazing things. But the Bible doesn't tell you there is time for preparation. Even with the disciples, there was time for preparation. They walked with Jesus for several years, and even after that, they had time for preparation. Heidi brought up Moses. Moses had time for preparation. God is building. And what's encouraging is that you may not know that God is even building you now, but he is preparing you. There is a purpose right here, your purpose, a calling. And every step of the way, he is building you so that you are ready for this. But you yourself need to commit yourself to Christ to become ready for this. It doesn't just happen. There is preparation involved. Preparation comes from daily studying his word, church. When you see Paul and what he must have been doing was he must have been fellowshipping with Christ. He even says the revelation of the gospel was not given to me by Peter, was not given to me by the apostles. I received it from the Lord. He went away to seek out God. And how many of us separate ourselves from this world to seek God out in this way? We must every day study his word, that his word might be the one transforming and shaping the way we think how we live out our lives, our character, and our attitude. Because when we're not in the Word, guess what? The media and all the things we consume our mind is shaping my thinking, is shaping my living, is transforming my attitude, is shaping my character. But if I am in the Word, then the Word of God starts taking over. The Word of God starts transforming my living. And I think a lot of us have trouble transforming our living because we're not being transformed by his word there is power in his word and it comes from the life of prayer to align your heart and will to his prayer is a tight fellowship with god in a place where you confess a place where you freely speak all your burdens, your frustrations, your complaints. Pastor Dennis was talking about complaining. It is a time to complain. It's a time for you to express. It's a time for you to unleash all of what is in your heart because you know why? God already knows what's in your heart. And through this, he starts shaping your heart. He starts aligning your will to his. And what's amazing is as you enter into a time of prayer in this fellowship, it builds your faith. You know why? Because a consistent and constant prayer life makes you understand as he starts answering and shaping you that he's actually listening. And in that moment where you realize that God is actually listening to you, that does something to you. That builds your faith. And you understand that God is with you. And we must live out what we believe in now. We have to put into play, we have to practice everything that the Bible is teaching us, everything that our pastors are teaching us, everything that we know about Christ, and what Christ wants us to do. We need to go out and evangelize. We need to go out and witness. We need to teach one another. We need to serve one another. We need to love one another. We need to disciple one another. We need to go out and do things that God is telling us to do. And this is where I think, not I think, let me make that stronger. I truly believe that the churches today are weak in this. We are weak, and I was sharing before service, many Christians today have or do not fully believe in the power of the gospel, have not experienced the power of the gospel have not experienced the power of Jesus' name or do not even know the power that is in Jesus' name, nor the power of his death and his resurrection because we're not stepping out in faith and allowing this power to come through in our lives. We believe in what we believe in, but we don't practice what we believe. And I believe this is why the church is weak today. We must go and witness. 
We must go and pray for people. We must be about healing. We must be about declaring the name of Jesus over people to cast out spirits, to cast out sickness. But since we don't do any of this and we doubt all of this, we don't rely on the power of God anymore. We need to now go. And so what a new heart what a new heart can do through the power of the gospel and the spirit is this, and I love this. Immediately, we do see Paul proclaiming that Jesus is the son. What's crazy is he was just on a murderous rampage to lock up all these Christians. Then in a moment as he meets Jesus Christ, he starts proclaiming that Jesus is the son of God. And he goes around the synagogues in Damascus proving that Jesus is the Christ. But what's amazing about this is Paul who was making the church suffer, started suffering on behalf of the church and for Christ. And this is what I want to talk about, what a new heart can truly do through the power of the gospel and through the spirit. And we see this and we know Paul, he was one of the greatest missionaries, if not the greatest missionary of history. He started the, the churches. And it says this in 2 Corinthians about Paul, and he's talking about himself, and he's boasting a little bit, but he says this. He says, are these servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? From someone who ravaged the church to someone who suffered for the sake of the church and Jesus Christ, he is someone who wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books. His writings still today have an effect on us right now. The disciples and Paul 2,000 years ago, these changed new radical hearts still have an effect on the world today and it is still transforming the world today. He was the catalyst for us, the Gentiles in receiving the gospel. And because of him and the disciples, the gospel is still now today being reached to the ends of the earth. And there have been so many catalysts from the time of the disciples until now. So many missionaries, so many people radically renewed to go forth to make a better life for other nations. Those who truly gave their lives for the gospel made it a better place to live for society, nations, and other cultures. The gospel first needs to radically change my life and heart, radically renew me so that it can start changing the environment around me. And I was praying and processing through this because of what is happening in our nation today. And it seems so impossible. This has been an issue for generation after generation. But what is impossible in our eyes is so possible with God. These 11 disciples, you know, 12 minus Judas and Paul, they flipped the world upside down. They lived in one of the most oppressive rules, the Roman rule, the most sinful um, environments and societies. And these guys with new hearts, with the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit are still making change 2,000 years later. This is what a new heart can do. And it reminded me of the time when we went to Korea after our Thailand mission, and we visited a place called, I'm gonna butcher this, but Yang Wajin Foreign Missionary Center. And it, this missionary center stirred my heart so much because if you guys know the history of Korea, and how Christianity um, started spreading 
and the proclamation of the gospel started happening, Korea um, was a country that literally killed all missionaries, killed all Christians that stepped foot on their land. There are over about 10,000 known martyrs. But as martyr, as Korea started killing off all these Christians and missionaries, it didn't stop foreign missionaries to coming into this land. Radically renewed hearts, loving Christ, loving the nation, a foreign nation. Western Europeans, other nations, Spain, would come into the land who they have no idea who, they, they don't have Korean friends, but they go into this nation to better this nation and to spread the love of Jesus Christ for the sake of salvation for these people they do not even know. And what's crazy about this is that they gave up their lives to literally die for Koreans, to die for this nation. And because they knew that they were killing off Christians, they would disguise their mission as doctors. They would go in as doctors and nurses. They would go in as teachers and set up schools. And they would secretly teach the gospel, secretly teach the message of Jesus, secretly teach the Bible. And this is crazy. And we went and we stood in this cemetery and there is this, uh, like this memorial place. These people literally gave their lives to die and be martyred in another nation. And this is what we need today, that we would give ourselves for another nation. We must be a catalyst for someone else, as we, someone else has been a catalyst for us in receiving the gospel. And I love this. If you study missionaries, I don't know about now because of the whole uh, COVID and how Asians are being blamed for it, but... Korean or Asian missionaries are the most well-received people in almost all nations. An Asian face is a face that is accepted by most countries. They are not hostile toward Asians. So Asians are the perfect catalyst to go into other nations, to go even into other communities right now. Pastor Dennis was talking about how we went to the prayer walk and people were honking and it's the, we were walking down Western right next to the Ralphs and these, this white car pulled up, it was these two black gentlemen and he was raising his fists. He was like, yeah, my Asian brother's standing up for us. He goes, America, I love this. We are the perfect catalyst to go into the Hispanic communities, the black communities, all other communities, to be the catalyst, to bring the gospel in to these other communities. And I love this, and I wanna talk about these four people real briefly. Horace Grant Underwood. Did you know that the founder of Seoul YMCA and Yonsei University, Yonsei University is one of the top, most prestigious universities in Korea, founded by Horace Grant Underwood, a foreign missionary. Douglas B. Avison, he was the founder of Severance Hospital. It is one of the oldest and the biggest university hospitals in South Korea, founded by a foreign missionary. Homer Hubert advocated for the independence of Korea, and he actually died in Korea. And his last quote was this, I would rather be buried in Korea than in Westminster Abbey. He loved Koreans and he fell in love with the nation for the sake of the gospel and salvation for people he did not even know. Ernest Bethel died after being imprisoned by the Japanese army for exposing abuses against Korean civilians. And then there's, there's countless more. And when you read about these catalysts who forsake their own lives to go into another nation to give this other nation a better life through the gospel, it made me reflect, what the hell am I doing with my own? For someone who has the gospel, for someone who knows the power of a changed and new heart and what that heart could do, Church, we got to get this together. We got to wake up. And throughout these foreign missionaries who died for the gospel, they literally all died to give these Koreans Jesus Christ. 
Today, there are over 10 million, not counting all past from those times, but right now, currently, there are over 10 million Christians in South Korea that was predominantly Buddhist before. But now the Christianity is rising in South Korea. We need to become a catalyst for other nations as well. We gotta stop being about our own. We gotta stop being stuck in our own Jerusalem. God didn't have it for us to just stick to our own kind. We, our own nation, has received help, support, people freed and spoke up for Korea's own independence. And I love this, and I'm, as I'm going through the history, I was moved. The power of the gospel is needed so that I could lay down my life to lift up another. It's not just about, it is about salvation. That is the end goal. But along that way, all of these foreign missionaries made Korea into a better place. They didn't come to just dump the gospel and leave. They came to give medical help, to teach their kids, to teach their um, families. They came to make a better society. And so what do we do? And I've been praying about this, and Heidi and I, we talk about this. We have got to go back to the basics, church. We have got to go back to the basics in preparing ourselves through discipleship, witnessing, and planting. And these are the three things I've wrote up. We have a little vision board, and I wrote Conquer LA. I, I shared this. We're going to conquer Los Angeles. And the three methods is through discipleship, witnessing, and planting house churches. And I know when you hear the word discipleship, oh, it's, it's like a nagging word. I, we know we're already doing discipleship. I'm already a disciple. We're already doing it. But let me tell you what. And I was kind of thinking about this, and I want to be straightforward with you guys. A disciple in the biblical terms is someone who follows Jesus Christ to be like his master, to be like Jesus. It is the full effort and commitment of your life to obey his teachings. It's not perfection. You're not going to perfectly commit, but it is a progression. There must be progress in this. And I love the standard that Jesus gives, and you know this, but I want to reiterate, redefine what discipleship is, because we need to, as a church, put our foot down now for the standard of the gospel so that we can make an impact in our world because our world is hurting. Our world is dying without Christ. Our world is... When you die without Christ... It is an eternal damnation. More than that is an eternal life without God. Can you imagine what it must be like to be eternally alive without God's presence? We have to wake up, church. And then Luke says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus is straight. This is Jesus talking here. He says he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So let me make this clear. In Jesus' own words here, this requirement and these standards, I ask you again, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Being a disciple seems nearly impossible with this standard. But I love this. A disciple is marked by progress and not perfection. And I will stress this. A disciple is marked by his or her commitment to Christ. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it 
must be marked by your commitment. Not to the church, not to the family group, as much as, yes, there is a commitment to that, but more so importantly, the commitment we need is in Jesus to love him, to obey him, to be about him, to think about him, to be in his word, to communicate with him, to fellowship with him. It is a commitment to Jesus Christ. And when we commit ourselves to Jesus in love and obedience, the way he wants us to, I believe we will experience that power that we are all lacking right now. I believe a lot of us haven't experienced that power, so we hold on to other hopes. We use other methods and other tactics. It's time to commit ourselves to Christ so that we may rely on him. And to be a witness, we must be a witness, church. As we are being equipped and trained, we must mature spiritually. We must continually practice out what we preach, believe in, and are valued of. Everything that we are always learning, we need to go outside into our families. Every day is a day of training. Every day with your family, at your work, you have to think of yourself as a place of training to reflect Jesus Christ. This is where we experience the true power of the gospel come to life. It's when we step out in faith and proclaim and have people either reject or receive this message. For Romans says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he says, for the word of Christ is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We must, again, realize this immense power. We must now, as the church, regain this experience of power, the power that is in the name of Jesus, the power that is from the Holy Spirit. He gives us immense authority to do something about the situations we live in. Can we get the praise team? We have to make reconciliation with all of our neighbors. And as I see it and as I prayed yesterday, the only way we will truly come to a place of reconciliation is through Jesus Christ. It is the only way. And as I envision us taking over Los Angeles, we have to plant. And Pastor Dennis has been talking about this and we've been discussing this and sharing this. And I could see even as the pandemic has hit, if this continues and the world continues to go in depravity, the big church model is not going to be sustainable. The newfound communities must be held within the homes. And as we go and witness, and as we go and make these new communities with all nations, we have to start diversifying our communities and setting up communities all over the city, all over. Not just this one Glory LA church on Grand in Washington, but we got to start planning these home communities all over the city that as we pray for the city that breakthrough would happen through the power of the gospel to make actual change man when god comes through change happens crazy change that you and i cannot do on our own and we see this in the bible i want to experience this now church we need to pray we need to go back to our fundamentals in discipling. If you are not serious about it, then pray that you will get serious. But those who are serious, step foot and come along and walk beside us. That we would commit ourselves to Jesus Christ and to our people to bring salvation and change in this place. To go outside into the streets and proclaim Jesus Christ and all of his glories. It's crazy. And I'll say this again. There is something so amazing about being outside and singing praise and being unashamed to declare his glories. 
I really feel the spiritual oppression loosening and freeing. We gotta be outside. We have to declare the goodness of Christ outside, to be unashamed outside. It's so easy to be a Christian here. It's so easy to go outside and help someone. But why is it so hard while you're helping to just simply tell them about Jesus? There is a spiritual oppression we need to free and loosen in this city. We need to do that outside. And I know you hear this all the time. It must be so nagging. But we got to go back to the basics and the fundamentals of our spiritual disciplines. And don't tell me it hasn't worked for you. Have you committed yourself the way Jesus has asked us to commit ourselves to him? To renounce all things, to love him more. We got to do this the right way. We got to do this the way Jesus is telling us to do this. And I believe him. I believe every word he tells me. And I know there is power in that. And I want to end with this. I was talking to Joanna yesterday, and she was like, I need help with application. I need help with um, telling me how to live out my Christian life. And it's funny, I, Heidi's always in, uh, really, it's one of my weaknesses. I have a hard time translating my own spiritual life um, to other people. And Heidi's been always kind of um, encouraging me in that aspect. And I'm growing in that aspect. And so after we hung up, I was kind of praying through and thinking about what we need to do as a church in the midst of what is happening, how to love our ailing community and it dawned on me it's so crazy it's my wife um, lives right next to me and her masters she has a master's in education on the emphasis of social justice her masters was for her to go into poor neighborhoods and to build the system of education to make that neighborhood rise. That's so powerful. And I was listening to all these YouTube people about the black community. And there was a statistic, I don't know if it was true, but it was startling. They said about 70% of black kids in the nation are illiterate. And this came up to my mind and I was like, babe, you know what we need to do as Korean Americans? What we could do right now to walk alongside and build and help these communities? We could go and we could tutor these kids. And she was telling me she knows the community center in Watts. We need to call local churches and partner up and walking alongside to spend our weekends teaching. We need to think of creative ways not to just be about the gospel, but as we teach them how to read, as we teach them math, as we teach them all the things that they need to be taught to live an empowered life to better themselves, we teach them the gospel. We teach them to read scripture. And I think this is such a powerful thing that we could do right now to go into those communities, to lift up and love and serve their kids for their future community, to empower and to lift the community up. Church, we gotta go outside our bounds now. We gotta be led by the Holy Spirit now. We have to be empowered now. We can't just stick to the same old routine. It's getting us nowhere. It's getting me nowhere. We gotta look outside. God is a grand, great God. There is no limits to who he is, how he works. I keep limiting him. I keep putting him in a box. I keep saying he only works like this, this, and this. But God is so much bigger. 
And church, I want to really, look, I know a lot of you are yearning to do something about the situation. But I am telling you, church, when you do something about the situation with Jesus, when you do it with the Holy Spirit, you will make true and everlasting change. Not just change for now, but that change will follow them for all eternity. That's the change we're looking for. For the now to the eternal. So guys, let's first get my heart straight with Christ so that I can start reconciling with the communities that I need to reconcile with and make true and everlasting change. This is what the power of the gospel can do through a new heart. We can change this nation because God will change it using us. We can't do it alone. Let's pray. Amen, church. Um, at this time, we're going to have a time of offering. Um, as you guys give your tithings and your offerings, may you guys really give out of a joyful, obedient heart, willingly. And um, we're so thankful for all the support that you guys been continue to give. And we want to continue to encourage you guys to be a blessing wherever you go. Um, you can give through our app or even through text message. And so please do that at this time and we'll have a song of praise and the closing of the benediction.
church again. Thank you for joining us this Sunday. Um, I want to just thank you guys for responding uh, by watching the movie Just Mercy or even picking up the book. And a new suggestion for the read this week is Be the Bridge. It's by Latasha Morrison. Uh, she's a Christian author, but it's on one of the New York Best Time sellers. And it really, really helps us as a church to be in the middle in this racial justice. Racial, um, reconciliation and I believe if you're gonna plan to stay in America as a church as a Christian then we should be educated and that we would really be sensitive and so pick that up I think that's a great read for this week it's not that long um, be the bridge let me just close us in a word of prayer father I'm so thankful that you are stirring in our hearts Causing us to break barriers, our bubbles. Things so often we seemed to take just for granted. To, to always kind of have our own comforts. But Lord, thank you that you are moving in such a great way. Where the nation will continue to stand against the work of evil. You are allowing even the church to arise to the occasion with the gospel, the, the, the key, the person of Jesus. We're doing it with you, Jesus. And Lord, I'm just reminded of the parable of the Good Samaritan. When the lawyers had asked, who's my late neighbor that I should love? And Lord, you gave the perfect parable. It was the Samaritan that went out of his way to help this poor victim without anything in return father you said that was an example of what a model neighbor is a neighbor who loves father thank you for letting us be able to see one another as your own creation to see the value of your workmanship, of your purpose on each individual. It doesn't matter what color, it doesn't matter what background, it doesn't matter of the social class, we get to see people as your own image. So thank you for putting that in our hearts. And so now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the amazing love of our Heavenly Father the communion of the Holy Spirit continue to unite your people that we would arise together as we await your return and all God's people said amen amen God bless you guys have a great week love to see you guys back next week and we're planning to open the church sometime mid-July be open to our um, news so God bless you guys <laughs>